Um, so <laughs> it's been a, it's it's obviously a mixed a mixed bag here. Uh, let me turn this thing here. Got it. Okay. Again, I appreciate um, the invitation, and of course, I hope you're all weathering the this pandemic as as well as as, as humanly possible. For my talk today, um, I thought I would share with you some of the research I've I've conducted um, in collaboration with a small group of archaeologists and environmental scientists on the um, Copper to Early Bronze Age transition in Iberia, that is the roughly the third millennium BCE, you know, around between 3000 and 2000 BCE. Um, I should say, however, that this research that our small team, you know, was involved in was based on the, you know, formidable uh, research of my Spanish and Portuguese colleagues who've been working, of course, in Portugal and Spain for, for you know, hundreds of years have carried out, you know, countless excavations um, and, and field projects. So, you know, we are standing on the shoulders of, 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 a, of a huge body of literature. And of course, we have to acknowledge that. Um, the archaeology of the third millennium um, is, it, Iberia is, has been the focus of my research, I'd say for my entire career in, in some way or another. So it's kind of exciting to kind of go back um, and sort of put it all together in some way, but also kind of focus on some of this more recent work we've done. So what I want to do um, at the beginning of this talk is just kind of get you, you know, give you a little bit more recent history, let's say, and sort of share with you how I got myself involved in this uh, question, you know, when the archaeology of Katina, so to speak. Uh, um, and then I'll turn to, I'll give you a little bit of background, of course, on the on the Copper to Bronze Age in Iberia. I don't expect everybody to, to know uh, what was happening during this time period. So I'm going to give, you know, a good amount of background so that you understand why um, someone like myself and, um, and lots of other folks um, have, have focused on this really interesting time period. And then I'm going to look and, and focus on the, the collaborative research that I did with a few people between around 2010 to around 2015 um, that addressed this topic, uh, the copper to early Bronze age transition and whether and what the role of climate change was um, in this cultural um, transformation that we see in the archaeological record. And at the very end, I'll briefly reflect on um, what um, we have found uh, archaeologically that might Oops. <laughs> Oops. Oops. Okay. Although I'm, I'm hearing some, some voices in the background here. Okay, I just want to give you, uh, just since you're maybe wondering what that image is that you're seeing right there on um, this first slide. Uh, what you see is, a, is an early Bronze Age site called a motilla um, in the La Mancha region of central Spain. The site is called Asuer. Um, we will revisit this, um, this site and this time period later on in the talk. Um, I, I show this slide because um, these motilla sites like Asuer were established around 2200 BCE, again, around the time of this important climate change event, um, which, you, which I'll talk about, uh, when there were uh, drought conditions in this particular part of Iberia. Um, recently, the Spanish hydrologist Miguel Mejias um, showed through um, uh, records of the hydrology of this region that there was a relationship between the geology and the hydrology and um, the location of these motilla sites. That is, people in the early Bronze Age, around 2200 BCE, established these sites in areas to best access underwater, uh, sorry, underground water uh, resources, aquifers, during this period of drought. Um, at the site of Asuer, um, uh, the folks built a 20 meter deep well to reach um, that nearest aquifer. And I think you can see that um, filled up uh, with some water there in the slide. But again, I'll talk more about this later. I should also finally acknowledge that the research that um, my, my team conducted was um, funded by a grant from the National Science Foundation. Okay. Okay, so again, a little bit of recent history. Um, as you heard, I did my BA at Boston University. And after completing that bachelor's degree in archaeology about 40 years ago now, I went to Portugal 
uh, for the first time. And I spent about six months as a, as a college graduate um, working as a technical assistant at this museum that you see right here, the Museo Nacional de Arqueología, the National Museum of Archaeology in Lisbon. Now, my undergraduate coursework at Boston University um, was primarily on the archaeology of the Eastern Mediterranean, or the Aegean, Anatolia, um, Greece, uh, for example, but I, and I knew nothing, absolutely nothing about um, Western Europe and Iberia in particular. Um, for many folks outside of Spain, Spain and Portugal, uh, particularly at that time, um, the archaeology of the peninsula was really quite poorly, poorly known, and there were various reasons for that. Um, Again, you know, clearly Portuguese and Spanish archaeologists have been doing that work. So for me, it was sort of a very eye-opening experience to, to work in the museum and then start reading about the Copper Age and the Bronze Age, which again, I knew nothing about. And what I learned at that time when I was reading these um, older texts about the Copper Age of Iberia was that uh, it was thought at that time that the Copper Age, again, the third millennium, early third millennium BCE, was um, the outcome of uh, migration, colonizers, colonizers from the Eastern Mediterranean who were drawn to the metal resources um, of Iberia. So this, what we see, it was thought that what we saw archaeologically was the outcome of, of colonization events from the Eastern Mediterranean. And, and there was a, there is very rich archaeology for this time period. But what really intrigued me was sort of what happened afterwards. Um, and, and when I tried to read about the early Bronze Age and the Bronze Age, particularly of, of sort of southwestern Iberia, Portugal, I found a fairly stark record. There really wasn't a whole lot to, to kind of work with, at least from the literature that I was finding in, that, in the National Museum at that time. So as a result, I, I became interested in that transition between the, the Copper Age and the Bronze Age um, for my graduate work. And that's why I ended up doing my uh, graduate dissertation research on. So here we're going to spend a little time giving some cultural background so that um, you know we're all on the same page here. So the Copper Age in Iberia, as I said, roughly spans the third millennium BCE. I think the third millennium is probably one of the more interesting millennia in the past, I would say. Um, and at this time in Iberia, we see the development of large stone walled settlements um, and monumental burial architecture. Uh, where the dead at that time were buried collectively. You know, people were not buried in individual graves like we see today. They were really buried kind of in, in, in sequences, but all together um, in a tomb, in multiple tombs, of course. Um, in the slide that you see here, um, you see some images of some of these uh, Copper Age hilltop sites. Um, one of these being the site of Zambujal. This is a stone walled settlement um, outside of the town of Torres Vedras. Um, that site was excavated by a German uh, colleague, uh, Michael Kunst, at least most recently, uh, for a number of decades. Um, you also see an image toward the bottom of a, a, a burial site, a, a truly monumental burial site called Montelirio near Sevilla, whose study um, has been coordinated by Leonardo Garcia San Juan, a professor at the Univers University of Sevilla. In the past few decades, a new kind of settlement site or new kind of site, I should say, <laughs> uh, has been identified and, and, and archaeologists have learned a lot more about, um, again, from the third millennium, third millennium, and these are called ditched enclosure sites. And you see an image of one of those there. This is the site of Perdigonch, um, whose excavations have been directed by the archaeologist Antonio Valera. The function of these ditched enclosure sites, unlike the burial and the settlement um, examples there, are they're much less clear. Um, there are burials found at these sites, um, but um, it wasn't only a burial site. It, it is quite possibly a place where people aggregated or gathered um, during periods of um, ritual events, feasts, um, important, important uh, times of the year. Um, archaeologists generally consider the Copper Age of Iberia as a uh, Copper Age of Iberia is the period when social differences were dramatically marked by the construction of monumental architecture. Again, you see some of those examples here, as well as the production and consumption of elaborate objects uh, likely made by craft specialists. Pretty stuff, basically. <laughs> um, and you see some, some glimpse of those examples here, uh, including amber from Sicily. So there was an exchange uh, from Sicily 
to Iberia, as well as ivory from North Africa. Um, and some of these uh, elaborate goods um, are, are, were found at Montelidio, which again, you see, you see down there. Um, Montelidio is a, is a truly monumental site. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a burial site. You can see this, it's a, it has a long a passage and a, and a chamber. Um, the corridor uh, is about 39 meters long. Um, and it's part of a mega site. It was part of a complex of other kinds of burials and, and um, sort of activity areas uh, uh, that was part of the Valencina uh, mega site. I will not go into that, but basically it's part of a bigger um, landscape of, of, of death and uh, living sort of activities. At Montelidio, um, just to give you a sense of why the Copper Age has been seen as such a period of sort of social complexity, social inequality, um, the largest uh, assemblage of amber objects um, known in Iberia was recovered um, in this one tomb. Um, how many do we have? About 250 amber beads and pendants just at this tomb. Uh, for comparison, uh, if we look at the next largest size or next largest assemblage of amber objects in Iberia during this time, um, the next largest was found at the site of Los Millares, uh, where in combination, when we combine the 80 megalithic tombs found at that site, um, only 10 of uh, 10 amber objects were found. So again, on a scale, this site is just sort of, you know, kind of up there on its own. And again, this amber um, derived from sources in Sicily. In addition to amber, um, about 250,000 um, shell and stone beads um, were found in association, in association with some burials um, uh, in, in the chamber, in, the, in this large chamber. Um, these beads um, were likely sewn onto fabric, uh, uh, burial shrouds um, that were used to cover, cover the bodies of the dead. Um, another example of this or sumptuous of this burial are these exquisitely carved um, hollow based arrowheads um, made of myelinite and rock crystal. I mean, truly, uh, you know, unique sorts of objects. Um, perhaps uh, one of the more intriguing aspects of this burial is that the 20 or so individuals um, housed, um, buried in the, main, in the tomb's main chamber were women. Or, or of indeterminate um, sex. And they were covered with cinnabar, uh, which is a form of mercury sulfide, which is giving their, gives their bodies or gives their remains this kind of bright red hue. In a nearby uh, burial structure to the site, uh, another remarkable set of goods was found, including this dagger that you see flaked uh, on a rock, on rock crystal with an ivory hilt. Again, this is just to kind of give you a sense of what's happening in the material world of the Copper Age, just, just the small glimpse. Okay, turning to um, the middle of the third millennium, around 2500 BCE, we see the, uh, the um, introduction of what we call bell beaker pottery and bell beaker kind of objects. Um, beaker ceramics are decorated thin walled ceramics with generally an S shaped profile. And they can be found in regular association with a set of other kinds of things such as uh, copper um, uh, uh, points or daggers. Um, now, what makes beakers, uh, the beaker culture, beaker material so exciting um, to Iberianists as well as Europeanists is that we actually see this phenomenon um, throughout much of Western Europe. So this is not something that just happened in Western in Iberia, but this is kind of a trans-European phenomenon. And as you might under, might guess, you know, a lot of people have tried to understand why I, all of a sudden at this one time, everybody's kind of using this kind of pottery. Um, most recently, some ancient DNA studies have been uh, done um, suggesting that um, this was uh, uh, contemporary with the uh, movement of people, um, particularly males, uh, from the steppic areas who replaced the genetic um, uh, background makeup of, of peoples um, in Iberia. Um, so this is, it's a complicated time period and I, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on, the, on this DNA work, but just so you know. A few hundred years after the Beaker period, um, around 2200 BC, which is again, the focus of this talk, um, we see the, a, a cultural change, uh, which we call the early Bronze Age. A lot of those sites from the Copper Age are largely abandoned. The burials basically stop there. All that craft specialization and long distance exchange that characterized the early third millennium seems to kind of drop away. Um, we see some beginning use of bronze, but not true alloying as in copper tin alloying. Um, 
And again, new kinds of practices um, in much of at least southeastern Iberia. We see people being buried in individual graves underneath people's houses, um, although there's some use, continued use of some older megalithic sites. Um, it used to be thought that this transition to the early Bronze Age was the result of, uh, again, population movements. But when you actually look at the material record, um, archaeological um, objects and things, um, there isn't, there aren't those signs of the of, of this kind of um, migration. So the question is, what happened? Um, and again, this is this is what led me to this to the study. So moving on to how I approach this work in my own work. Um, because so little was known about the early Bronze Age in terms of like just lifeways, um, even sort of dating, radiocarbon dating, at least uh, outside of the southeastern part of Iberia, I decided for my dissertation work to work at and excavate an early Bronze Age settlement um, for a few years. And this was the site of Agrual. Um, this is a site, um, a settlement site located on this uh, on this hill that you see here, a ridge, um, a little bit north of, this, of the town of Tomar, if you've been to Portugal. Um, I learned about the site uh, because I had been working at that time, um, helping out a friend, Joan Zillian, at some caves in the area. And one afternoon he said to me, Katina, you know, there's this Bronze Age uh, settlement over here, you know, maybe you want to excavate it for your dissertation. And I said, sure, <laughs> in more or less. And that um, that was kind of what got me um, got me working there. As you can see from the image um, of Agrawal, located on the on the Rio Nabao, overlooking the Nabao, it's, it's in a pretty strategic location. It has great visibility north and south of the river. It's you know obviously got access to to water. Um, good agricultural land a little bit to the north. There's a freshwater spring at the base of the hill. So lots of good reasons why people might have wanted to live there. Um, and I excavated there again with some friends and, and undergraduates um, from Yale University where I was a student. Oops. Looks like we're frozen. Just uh, just give it a minute. Hey, Eric, how long is this lecture for? Uh, should be about an hour from start to finish. Yeah, no drama. Thank you. That's a hello from Australia. Since we are waiting. Uh, can I turn on the, the CC? I just had a request uh, and I wasn't sure if I could do it without having asked Katina before. Yeah, it, it shouldn't be a problem. Shouldn't be a problem. Think. Okay, yeah. But she's not here now. <laughs> <laughs> well, while, while we have a minute, our uh, upcoming lectures, we have Peter Bokoki, I hope I'm saying that right, uh, presenting the archaeology of cheese, and Kathleen Lynch, that's, sorry, that's February, and then Kathleen Lynch in March, uh, talking about wine, wine and truth, the ancient Greek symposium. So we have wine and cheese coming up in the next two months. Those of you who have the videos on could tear, turn it off. Maybe it's better for Katina. I don't know what happened to her. 
Uh, that shouldn't affect it. Um, okay. But she's probably just having intimate problems. That's all. Yeah. Probably just wait for a minute and she'll pop back on when she gets it sorted on her end. <clears throat> ah, the pleasures of Zoom. Well, this is the first time that we have someone dropping off completely. Yeah, they're not even from Europe. <laughs> they're in the States. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, we had some problems, but it was Zimbabwe. So, ah, she's here. I can't hear anything. Hi. Are, can you see me now? Yes, Katina, we can see ya. We can see hey, you. welcome back. Yeah, we can see you. What happened there? Well, I, I think I know what happened. I got bumped off. Okay. So here. Okay. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Great. So let's um, move on from Agrual, the excavation of this early Bronze Age settlement there. Um, what did we find um, in addition to this underrated pottery? Um, some evidence for local smelting of copper, um, lots of animal bones, which allowed us to date the site, as well as a, a fish hook made of metal, but a fairly unimpressive, let's say, uh, material record, a really uh, quite a different scenario. From, from the Copper Age um, materials. So following this project, and probably because I was a little frustrated by um, the lack of you know, preserved settlements and a lot of you know, uh, diagnostic materials to work with, I started to focus on the materials um, prior to the Bronze Age. Um, so I did work on amphibolite tools, uh, polished stone tool sourcing um, in exchange for a few years. Then I dedicated myself to the slate plaques, uh, engraved slate plaques of Iberia. And then uh, most recently, the excavations at the rock of Valores in Portugal, where people um, were buried uh, during the. <coughs> so, with this work behind me, I wanted to come back to revisit um, this question that originally drew me to the third and second millennium uh, BCE. Let me start up my video again. So I can see myself a little better. Maybe I won't. Okay, this time, however, I realized I needed a team of archeologists and environmental specialists to work with me to assess this, um, this transition in particular, the, the role of the 4.2 KYA event, the role of the climate event, uh, which has been um, documented in around 2200 BCE. This event, by the way, is also known as the Bond Event 3 and has been associated with cool and arid conditions in some regions of the world, um, such as Iberia, but it was also associated with wet conditions or flooding in other regions, as you can see on this map. Beginning in the 80s and 90s, archaeologists began to wonder if this event um, might have been, um, you know, an important uh, trigger, you might say, to uh, the collapse or cultural disruptions that occurred in other regions of the world, including the Akkadian Empire in the Near East and Old Kingdom Egypt. The causes of the climate event itself and other, other kinds of climate events in the, in the Holocene are unclear, but they may be linked to solar cycles, uh, changes in the North Atlantic Ocean circulation and other variations in the atmosphere. It should be said, hold on here, It should be said that not all climate scientists or archaeologists agree that this event occurred or that it impacted um, societies uh, equally. Okay. 
team, uh, I assembled a team based on people, uh, based on... Uh, um, um, sorry, sorry, yes. Katina, sorry to interrupt you. Could you please uh, play that slide again, please, the, the previous slide? Sure. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So I brought, I brought together a team of, of specialists, of archeologists and climate scientists, uh, again, uh, drawing on the NSF grant that I was awarded in 2012. The team was made up of Antonio Blanco Gonzalez, a professor at the University of Salamanca right now, uh, Brandon Lee Drake, um, who you see there by the Great Wall in China, um, an environmental archeologist uh, at the University of New Mexico, and the pollen scientist, the palynologist, uh, Jose Antonio Lopez Saez, who uh, is with the Spanish Research Council. The role of climate change on human behavior, particularly in ancient societies, is a field of significant debate, in part because of its relevance to current discussions of global, global climate change. I would also suggest that these large scale processes can help us think through other kinds of global events um, such as the pandemic we are currently experiencing. Archaeologists in collaboration with other scientists are well positioned, um, I think, to make important contributions to these discussions because we have access to a large set of data about human life ways of the past. And we can, of course, collaborate with others who also have different kinds of uh, data to these, uh, to these life ways. Specifically, we have proxies proxies, traces left behind that help us to infer indirectly um, what these original behaviors or conditions were like. And you could say, well, all archaeology really is proxy. That is, we can't actually see what people were doing in the past, no, no, always the reasons for these um, activities. The proxies that we have available to assess the question of the relationship between climate change and culture change in the third millennium are pollen, um, which of course tell us something about environment and climate, and as well as as well as human um, transformations of this uh, environment. We have radiocarbon dates, which give us, of course, information about chronology as well as population levels, something about demographics. Um, and we have, of course, the sites and artifacts um, people left behind. These tell us about cultural lifeways. So, for our research, um, our team took a multi-proxy approach to the question of the third and second millennium um, BCE in Iberia. And, and we took, we decided we wanted to look at the, at the entire peninsula for this question. And you see some of the papers that we, we published uh, based on this research. For the radiocarbon dates, um, we were able to use the, the database that uh, Antonio Gilman, who you see uh, illustrated here, photographed here, who is a specialist in the archeology span of Iberia. Uh, Antonio was on my dissertation committee and throughout, um, you know, ever since I was a graduate student uh, working with him, he generally shared the database that he had been carefully cultivating and curating um, of all these kinds of, all the hundreds of, of radiocarbon dates that people had been publishing. He also shared this database, by the way, with other colleagues. Um, he annotated them, he provided context for these dates. It was an incredible um, uh, sort of uh, data set, you might say. Um, more recently, he uh, shared this data uh, and is now, all this data is now available online um, at the site IDEARC. And you can, you can see some of the screenshots from, from those pages there. There are thousands of, of radiocarbon dates um, associated uh, with, this, with this database here. So for our research, uh, we had to, we, you know, of course, we're only interested in the, those from the, the Copper and Bronze Ages. And of those, we did a bit of culling. We did a bit of auditing. We only took dates um, uh, for our study of uh, short life samples um, and also those with standard deviations that were relatively small, less than 5% of their BPH. And of course, all these dates were calibrated. And in the end, um, we worked with a set of about 4,000 radiocarbon dates. All of these dates were geo-referenced. Uh, we have, uh, you know, obviously longitude, latitude for all of those dates so we could plot all those sites uh, that we were working with. Um, for pollen, um, the palynologists um, uh, selected high-resolution pollen records from throughout Iberia 
uh, from mires, marshes, and lakes, as well as from archaeological sites, uh, many of which he had done the work on um, himself. And of course, for the archaeological cultural um, information we drew on, Antonio and I primarily drew on you know, all the site reports we could, we could uh, you know, gather and um, derive information about cultural patterning. If you've been to Spain and Portugal, you'll know that um, the Iberian Peninsula is a highly diverse, um, provides highly diverse landscapes. Um, this reality and the geographic barriers um, separating the peninsula from continental uh, Europe and the African continent can, see, can, can make it seem like a kind of laboratory for socio-ecological studies. That is, you can sort of look at the, the relationship between environment <coughs> other kinds of variables in a sort of relatively um, tidy sort of way. Um, of course, these boundaries were not fixed and not solid boundaries. Um, broadly speaking, um, the, I, the peninsula can be divided into two major zones or two major biogeographical regions. Um, first, the Atlantic facade, the north and northwest of um, the peninsula, which experiences and features abundant rainfall. Um, between 1,000 and 25 millimeters per year and is typified by a deciduous forest cover. And then you have the south um, and the interior, which is characterized by a more Mediterranean kind of uh, regime uh, with uh, warmer and drier um, weather patterns. So given this highly variable, highly heterogeneous aspect of the peninsula, Clearly, we had to take that into account uh, in our study. We had to kind of basically divide up the, uh, the peninsula into different kinds of um, cultural geographic uh, regions in order to do our studies, to track the relationship between climate change and cultural change. Um, and based on what we know about the archaeology of the peninsula, we, Antonio and I basically decided on um, dividing up the peninsula into five uh, general regions, uh, the Northwest, the Northeast, the Meseta, the Southwest, and the Southeast. Uh, and as you probably can gather, these, these geographic boundaries, these biogeographic boundaries don't really correspond very nicely with national borders or you know, modern political boundaries. Um, and so this is a kind of a, a, sorry, a, a plea, you might say, <laughs> to archeologists working in Spain and Portugal to, I think, kind of see beyond the national borders and their provincial borders to, to kind of best understand what's going on in the ancient past. Um, because to, to understand the ancient record, we clearly have to go beyond uh, and outside of uh, current national borders. So what I wanna do now is take a quick look at each of the regions and what we, uh, what we see uh, using the different proxies that we worked with. So first uh, we'll look at the Northwest. What you see here is a um, basically this, uh, what we call the sum calibrated radiocarbon date sequence, the trends uh, uh, drawing on the radiocarbon dates um, from old, older dates to, to more recent dates from left to right in years, calibrated years BCE. Uh, marked in those so dashed lines there is the 4.2 KYA event, the beginning and the end of it, more or less as we as we understand it. So what we can see, you know, roughly speaking, um, for the northwestern part of the peninsula, is that populations um, do seem to have declined a bit. At least the the demographic footprint, fingerprint of the archaeological record does seem to decline um, following the 4.2 KYA event. But you also see that prior to that event, there, there are ups and downs um, as well. So, so this event does not seem to have been a particularly marked event um, relative to other, other kinds of events that was, were happening in the Holocene in the Northwest, at least based on these uh, radiocarbon dates. In terms of the pollen record and what they can tell us about the environment and also um, people's subsistence practices, um, the record does suggest that Bronze Age subsistence patterns and strategies were somewhat different from those of the Copper Age. Um, from around 2000 BCE, for example, we see in the pollen record a new phase of cereal cultivation and increased uh, grazing pressure in the lowlands of this region. 
looking to the cultural um, record, the archaeology patterns and, and burials and settlements, there were no major changes um, in, the, in the settlement or, or mortuary practices between the Copper and Bronze Age. I mean, they're, they're there, but they're not as dramatic as you'll see in other parts of the world, other parts of Iberia. So in short, while there is a, a palynological uh, record or evidence for the 4.2 KYA event in this, in this region in the Northwest, its signature is relatively moderate. Um, there were some changes in the, in the economy of peoples, uh, but not major ones in the settlement and burial record. Um, this is suggestive, and this has been interpreted by, by me and Antonio as, as an example of a kind of resilient um, life way a life way that was able to kind of bounce back and, and uh, adjust in minor ways to whatever climate events people were experiencing. Turning now to the Northeast, um, a somewhat different, a different pattern. What we see actually, uh, the 4.2 KY event, at least the period right after that is actually a period of increase, a demographic increase in this area, um, uh, again, after the event. Um, the pollen record is a bit complicated because you have uh, marked uh, geographic differences between the highlands and the lowlands, between the inland and the mountains. So you're seeing actually a kind of a mixed, a mixed picture there that um, I won't really go into. Um, in terms of the cultural record, uh, the early Bronze Age, again, the period after the 4.2 KYA event, tests to an increase in agrarian production and sedentism, you know, increasing sedentary sanitarization of populations, uh, new ceramics, but continuities in the burial record. So in some, the picture in the Northeast is sort of similar to that of the Northwest. There are some continuities, uh, although uh, some, some increase in population. So, so whatever was going on in terms of the pollen record, um, people still kind of expanded and sort of thrived um, demographically. So let's move south to the Meseta. Overall, uh, human activity uh, increased prior to the 4.2 KY event. You see some pretty um, interesting trends there. But after the event and even during the event, it stayed pretty steady. In terms of the pollen record, um, there are abrupt shifts in the in local climate conditions. There are clear signatures, clear markers of, of a drought, of a, of a period of, of uh, stress, um, water pressure in this region. Culturally, also important changes, uh, both changes in both settlement uh, pattern and burial patterns. If you recall, it's in this region that people uh, you know, left their Copper Age uh, settlements and established these motilla sites uh, like Asuer, uh, which took advantage of uh, available uh, underwater aquifers. So people seem to adapt to uh, this, this pressure of the 4.2 KYA by you know, shifting, their, shifting their settlement um, structures and, and patterns. Turning now to the Southwest, um, there's very, very interesting uh, things going on here. Um, this is, of course, Southern, southern Portugal, southern, Southwestern Spain. What you can see is that this region shows a steep and statistically significant decline beginning around 2500 BCE to about 1400 BCE. That is the trend, uh, the demographic decline begins well before the 2200 BCE um, marker. The paleobotanical records for this region are fairly limited, but they show a combination of weakening, weakening um, anthropogenic pressure um, as well as aridity. So sort of a fewer people on the landscape um, as well as aridity with no apparent stabilization um, until the late Bronze Age. Culturally, um, as those of you who work in this region know, there were major, major disruptions, major abandonments um, taking place uh, throughout this period. Um, the settlements, um, those ditched enclosures, many of those burials that were established in the Southwest were basically abandoned um, and new kinds of uh, practices, new kinds of burials occur again around 2200 BCE. People shift to a more individualized burial um, pattern um, in stone line cysts. What this evidence shows us is that the timing of the cultural changes was quite different uh, from that of the rest of the peninsula. Um, demographic changes appear to be unrelated to the 4.2 KYA event, although of course the cultural record is quite pronounced such that we, you know, we call it the early Bronze Age because something new is happening. 
Finally, uh, let's look at the Southeast. Southeastern Iberia um, exhibits one of the most remarkable cultural histories in, in Western Europe, um, we could argue. Um, the narrative, the regional narrative in this, in this part of Iberia is also stronger and more clear than for other regions because of the intensive period of, uh, of archeological research uh, here. What we see in terms of population is that there's a steady increase uh, of uh, occupation, at least a demographic, demographic signature in the Southeast prior to the 4.2 KYA and even continuing after this period, following, uh, followed by a kind of plunge at around 1800 BCE. In terms of the pollen record, um, we see declining uh, environmental conditions for subsistence economies and increasing aridification of the region. So a, a marked transformation of the agrarian landscapes that people were, were engaged with. In terms of culture, um, there's certainly prior to the, 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 the 4.2 KYA event, uninterrupted increase in human activities, although some pronounced changes in you know, where people were establishing themselves and in their burial record. Um, the most dramatic shift happens at again around 2200 BCE when people establish themselves on these hilltops um, and a new kind of cultural configuration known as the Argaric, highly hierarchical, uh, integrated regional polity. Some people have argued that this was a, an emergence of the first state um, in Western Europe. Um, but the contributing role of environment and immigration from other regions to the Southeast, to this particular region, remains to be fully explored. Um, one thing that I um, proposed after doing this research was that um, it's quite possible that people were moving from the southwestern part of the peninsula to, to this region of the peninsula, at least you know, based on the, what we're seeing in terms of the demographic uh, patterns here. So looking at these regions um, next to each other using a general linear model of exponential growth, um, this is again sort of a comparison of all these different regions. Um, the dotted lines indicate once again, the 4.2 KYA event. And the uh, blue line uh, represents the exponent, uh, expected exponential growth. Um, so basically a kind of a smoothing line here. What these models show us is that the regions where departures from the expected trends were greatest were the Meseta, the Southwest and the Southeast, basically the Southern half of the peninsula. The Northern half of the peninsula uh, showed much less, uh, far less in the way of significant departures from this trend. Uh, as, as I've mentioned, this may be regarded in terms of a, a form of uh, stability and resilience instead of uh, what others might have called the past cultural backness or isolation. So summing up some of our key conclusions, one of the most intriguing, uh, I think, result of our research is the decline in population in the Southwest um, you know, co happening at the same time with an increase in the Southeast, both beginning around 2500 BCE. This may represent a possible population shift. That's at least one of the factors. That's, that's one of the, the phenomena that are, that are occurring at the same time. The pollen data analyzed suggest important climatic and environmental changes during this period of study. But so again, there is, there is, I think, pretty clear signatures according to the palynologist for a 4.2 KYA event, but there are a lot of regional differences. Uh, the Northwest and the Atlantic region of, of Iberia shows a lot more stability uh, on this front than the Southwest or, or the Southeast. And interestingly, this kind of trend, this palynological trend is paralleled by similar cultural uh, dynamics. What's interesting, um, I think also to think about is that while the pollen data shows a period of aridity, increasing aridity through the, about the 2500, 2200 BCE, overall human activity across the peninsula increased throughout the, this entire time period. That is, you know, more sites are getting established, populations we, we are assuming um, are also increasing even during this kind of difficult period. So even though conditions may have been arid, at least in southern half of Iberia, there was apparently enough arable land to facilitate an expansion of settlement and agriculture. So what our research suggests is that it's complicated, this relationship. Um, the, the relationship between the 4.2 KYA event, culture change and demographics it, it involves important regional um, variability. 
So wrapping this up here, how can we take these data and draw on this to think about our current um, circumstances? Certainly the regional variability that we see archeologically suggests um, that we need to be careful about assigning explanatory functions um, to climate forces like the 4.2 KY event. And here I'm gonna make a big jump here over to the pandemic. Um, in some of the uh, images and graphs that you see here, quotes here, you can see that the same event, in this case, the pandemic that we are experiencing can have very different um, uh, consequences uh, 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 to different individuals and communities, depending on their local um, sort of circumstances. For example, the in case in point, the CEO of PayPal or Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos and other CEOs of these companies, um, these years, these last few years have been blockbuster years. These are the best of times uh, for these folks. What the present moment tells us, I think, is that major climate or epidemiological events can amplify social or economic differences, which themselves may trigger subsequent transformations depending on local histories. Um, going back to Iberia, the social landscape of the peninsula prior to the 4.KYA event, if you recall, the Copper Age was associated with the bell beaker culture, uh, believed to represent the emergence of a, an elite class of individuals. Perhaps the 4.2 KY event enhanced the power or status of some of these individuals that kind of emerged um, at this time period. But for others, perhaps it signaled um, the end of a way of life. And for others, those folks and communities living in the northern part of the peninsula, um, their life ways remained relatively unchanged. So with that, um, I, I wanna thank you for your attention and, um, you know, again, I'm grateful to all of you for being here and apologies for the sort of technical glitches. And um, if you're interested in reading more about um, the for history of Iberia, um, a little shameless plug here, you're welcome to purchase my book. Um, uh, and uh, which of course um, draws on the research of, of many, many hundreds of colleagues of, uh, of Spain and Portugal. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was really interesting. We have a uh, we have a few minutes for questions. If, if anyone has any. Okay, let me get out of this here. Uh, you can use the little hand raising icon on the bottom there. Yeah, let me. What I want to do is. Or just type it directly in the chat. That's fine too. Uh, I see a hand. Um, Shalom. Hi, Katina. Thank you so much for the lecture. Um, I just had a quick question for you. With mm -hmm. regards um, to what you've spoken regarding um, the archaeology side of things and stuff. Sorry, um, a little bit of introduction. I'm a chemical engineer and mm -hmm. uh, I'm based in Australia. And I work for a defense contracting company. And um, we are looking at turning our organizations into net, into net zero emissions by 2050. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so my role is basically helping to get there. So my I'm I'm sort of like researching about climate change and and you know the steps that can be taken and that sort of stuff. So um like with your lecture um like how would you connect archaeology with climate change, of course, I mean, you did mention this Poland data and um, lots of environmental techies um, yeah. looking at the area and stuff. Um, so how would you directly make a connection saying that, you know, because of climate change, yeah. something happened to the earth and, and to particularly the people um, on the Iberian Peninsula? Yeah, that's, that's an excellent question, Shalom, thank you. Um, before I answer it, what I'm trying to do is sort of get my screen, um, take out my PowerPoint and I'm having a really hard time navigating. Everything seems to have frozen because I would like to be able to see people's faces. Is anybody on the other end like Doris, can you? Can you? I, no, I cannot. You cannot do it. No, because you're the one sharing the screen. I cannot stop sharing. I cannot move my, okay, we've had slight problems here. Anyway, let's just move on here. So here's the, here's the thing here. Um, 
clearly the population levels, the nature of societies that exist in Iberia, 3000, 2000 BC are very, very different um, than what we were living through today, right? We, we're living in highly um, dense population zones. We're living in state societies. We're living in a highly integrated, interdependent world right now. So, you know, the kinds of things, the kind of options, let's say, people had 5,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago to deal with um, climate events like moving, like moderate, you know, moder you know modifying their, their economic practices without major, you know, uh, without passing laws, for example, they had, it, things were a lot easier, <laughs> Shalom, in those days to, to deal with to deal with um, drought, for example. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, so, so we are. So, so the so I think the reality is that we can we have we cannot do what people did. <laughs> we cannot imagine that we can do what people did four thousand, five thousand years ago. We cannot directly take what we've learned about the four point two ky of a and say, okay. Now let's do this. We can't because our world is totally different. But I think what it does tell us something, um, especially when you think about those areas of resilience and those areas in the northern part of the peninsula, for example, where disruptions were sort of relatively minimal as we can maybe think about ways where, you know, what is going on in these communities? How were they organized? How are they subsisting? And what were some of the cultural factors that maybe we can draw on as, as sort of ways to mitigate some of the, the, the factors, the, 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 the impact of the climate changes that are happening here? Again, people could move in those days, right? You know, this area, this part of the land is, is the soils are not good. Well, we'll just pick up and go somewhere else. We don't have those options as much anymore, right? So, so I think we have to be careful. Um, to, I mean, certainly we want to read about the past and learn about the past, but we can't just impose those lessons and sort of plonk them on today because our, our cultural reality, our social reality is, is totally different. Does that help? Yep, yep, thank you. Thank you so much for answering sure. my question. Sure. Um. I have a question and an action and an observation as well. First of all, thank you very much for for lecturing us. Uh, this is the most I've learned about uh, this particular area and uh, the cultures involved in a long time. But um, what I would think that uh, you know, I I, I, f I did find your comparisons on the graphs, very interesting, but you probably uh, have had some resistance from the academic community saying, well, maybe it also reflects the difference in the amount of archeological work that's been done in those areas. Um, and if, if there was an even amount done in every area, you might get uh, a different graph. Uh, that's my first question. My second question is that basically a couple, uh, about a year ago, I read Barry Cunliffe's book on the ocean uh, because you were talking about social changes. And uh, he had a, a very interesting part uh, in uh, about the Iberian Peninsula. And um, he also within that had a section uh, discussing uh, the Beaker people and, uh, and, and how their culture spread so rapidly and unex I would think unexpectedly. Um, and uh, talking about social change, he, he gave a number of possibilities for, that, uh, for how that happened. One of the most interesting, though, I have to tell you, was that he he is of the opinion that uh, not only did the beeper, uh, beaker culture uh, culture st um, start in Iberia, but its rapid spread uh, may be the result of some of the beaker vessels 
uh, being essential for the production of a particular alcoholic drink and the storage and distribution of that drink uh, mm -hmm. so that it was easily adaptable uh, by other people in, in, in Europe. Uh, and they just uh, mm -hmm. uh, actually uh, accepted the whole wider part of the culture uh, and, and maybe got the alcohol at the same time. I know that sounds fair fetched, but that's his opinion. Uh, what are your comments on my, my first observation and my second? Yeah, these are, these are really excellent points, um, Jinx. Um, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I, I should say that I haven't experienced, like we haven't experienced, our team hasn't experienced like obvious pushback because, you know, we are we we realize we all realize that we can only work with what we have available to us uh, archaeologically and yes the the history of research the number of radiocarbon dates in different regions the number of sites that we've been able to people have been able to excavate is is highly variable and no doubt some of these trends are being um, shaped by or in a sense an artifact of not just ancient human behavior right but human behavior of the archaeologist variety, right? The archaeological um, research being done. So this is, you might say, a the best, you know, the best uh, picture we have right now. But maybe in twenty years, those those trend lines will look a little different. I, I would gather they probably won't look dramatically different, but they might look smoother in some areas. We'll just have to see. Um, your second point about the the beaker, the beaker folks, so the beaker phenomenon. Yeah, so the old the it is true, and this is the this is the so the oldest the earliest of beaker ceramics do appear in Iberia. So you know it, it is believed uh, that they they date uh, they come from the Iberian Peninsula. Um, yet we're also being you know told the story that the beaker people are people that kind of came um, from the steppic region, you know, moved through through Europe. And uh, again, replaced um, the genetic um, makeup of, of peoples in, in Britain, Britain and, and the Iberian Peninsula. This, the sec, the mid third millennium is clearly a complicated time period. Um, I, I, I can't think through it all at this point myself. Um, it is true that some of these vessels, some of these vessels do seem to have been used for consuming alcoholic beverages, um, but, but we also know from residue studies of, of some of these vessels, even in Iberia, is that they were doing lots of things with these vessels. They were they were cooking with them. They were putting cremated uh, remains of uh, you know, human remains in them. So so as with all human behavior, it's hard for us to say all beakers did this. You know, some beakers were probably used for the consumption of alcoholic beverages of some sort um, that you know would have been consumed during elite events or elite run events, um, but they were not always, they were not always used in this way. So does that help? Yes, and thank you very much. I, I'm, this is time well spent. Thank sure. you. Sure, thank you so much. So I see hands of Doris and Michael at this point. Uh, actually, Jim asked the question that I was going to, to ask, which was exactly about, uh, uh, how to account for the the differences in terms of uh, uh, of excavations and uh, and data from one region to the other? And I was trying to actually get a little better view of one of your slides that has five graphs comparing the, yeah. the five different uh, uh, regions, and they were some of them were significantly different. And so my my question when I was seeing them, first of all, I, I couldn't really figure out what they were marking if it was population of or pollen density, I couldn't see very well. And, uh, and so my question is, okay, can be really a difference of, uh, of population, but it could also be just a difference of uh, the numbers of sites that have been excavated and where we may have more, um, more data. And so yeah. my question is, how do you account for that? Um, that's not so easy to do. Yeah, I mean, I think this is, this is, this is gets back to the issue of proxy, right? So, so these dates are proxies of multiple things. They're, they're proxies of where there is a site, but they're also proxies for, for how much, you know, where people have done archeological research um, and where they've been able to get good dates, right? Um, and so it's, you know, more research has been done in the South and Southern half 
versus the north, but that's that is changing rapidly. And there may be people in this room who can attest to that, that there's been increasing work done in, in northwestern Iberia, for example. Um, I don't know if there's an easy way to get at disentangling the role of uh, history of research, history of investigation, um, but clearly it's a factor, right? It's, it's clearly there. Yeah. Um, Michael? Or Mike? Let me unmute. Am I unmuted? <clears throat> yes, you are muted. <laughs> yes. Um, this is this is fascinating to me, and I'm really I'm really interested in this. I'm just an amateur, you know. I mean, I'm somebody who's read a lot, and well, not a lot, but I mean, a lot for me on um, on 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 archaeology and prehistory, and and I'm very interested in that. And my wife and I we're we're going to be moving to Portugal. We're going to do this in uh, in, uh, in in at the end of end of uh, March, coming up here, and so. I'm very, very excited about exploring as much as possible some of these uh, settlements and, and, and archaeological sites and also the, the museum that you mentioned. So, um, and others. Uh, but so, so this is very pertinent to me. I just finished reading uh, The Dawn of Everything mm. with, with uh, Graber's, you know, and uh, and I mean that, that was the that was a book that was done by an anthropologist and a, and a, and a, and, a, and a, 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 an archaeologist. Mm -hmm. So uh, and it, it was but so this question of the relationship, and also I will mention that my background is in landscape architecture and landscape geography. You know, mm -hmm. I was the devot devotee of J.B. Jackson and other cultural uh, landscape geographers, and uh, and and. Uh, uh, it, I was at UC Berkeley doing studying that, but um, the uh, what what I'm I'm very interested in settlement patterns and how they relate to the kind of political structures and evolution and and progress that people had of developing you know, and Graeber is one to very much saying that it's a back and forth kind of thing that, that the evolution of these things is not it's like you say it's very complicated, and it and. Um, you know, for example, you know, the transition to agriculture uh, uh, was was one that most people, you know, uh, uh, of that time of the of the periods when that happened, uh, uh, that that revolution um, were dragged kicking and screaming into it. You know, there's a lot of resistance on the part of of, 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 of uh, indigenous peoples to to that kind of thing. But I, I wish to, I wanted you to comment on you meant you meant some comment about how one of the sites that you were talking about showed that it was was perhaps the first state uh, that was theorized that it was, might have been the first state. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about, talk to some about this, about, about what this shows how people lived and also the relationship at this time period, this is also the time of the megalithic monuments uh, all over Europe and, um, uh, you know, from, uh, from, from the Mediterranean islands to, various islands in the Mediterranean all the way through Turkey and and then all through Europe and into uh, England, you know, the Celtic areas of England. So how does it relate to that? Well, I mean, the, the, I'll start with one part of that question. I mean, what's happening in southeastern Spain during this, what we call the Argaric period, the early Bronze Age period, um, mm -hmm. is a very unusual um, phenomenon for Iberia. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, a, it's something very special, something very different was happening um, in terms of not so much the burial practices because an individualized burials, you know, as a, as a general new way of dealing with the dead was something people were engaged in throughout Iberia. But what was really distinctive about Argaric burials is that they were under people's houses um, they're what we call intramural burials. Um, and you don't really see intramural burials like anywhere else in Iberia at this time. So, so I mean, and we know that funerary practices are really closely tied to people's ideologies, to their religion, to all kinds of things. So something was happening in this part of, of Iberia that, that was quite different um, than, than other parts of the peninsula. 
Um, you know, it's also quite clear that there were some special people uh, living at these sites who were buried with diadems, who got, you know, sort of medals. Um, uh, and they have, have let's say, um, some ancestry in other parts of the Mediterranean world or other parts of Europe. But it's hard to relate that to, to what else is happening in other parts of the peninsula. I mean, it, I think people were kind of living in their own worlds. I mean, we, what we call Iberia as like a place wasn't really probably conceived of as a place, you know, a unified place by people 5,000 years ago. I mean, everybody had their own sort of, were living in their own world. So, um, so yes, there are, there are connections, there are similarities, but I'm not sure people were really like identifying themselves as like Iberian or you know similar to people living in Northwest. They may have spoken a different language for all we know. Um, I mean, megaliths um, were largely built prior to this time period. So the Argaric, by the time the Argaric rolls around, people had largely stopped burying their dead in these big, big tombs. Although there are some, some folks that still stuck their dead in these older tombs. It's almost as though that the 20, around 2200 PC, there was kind of a crisis of, of belief, <laughs> if, if we can talk about these things. We don't often do that uh, for archeology, span but I think I'd like to go there a little bit right now. Um, and that is that people's um, belief in their, maybe their ancestral ways, the belief in their gods, the belief in the power of gods, to do things in a certain way, I may have actually been impacted in by the climate events, to be quite honest. And that may have been what generated some of these changes in, in burial practice, which again, which are so closely tied to people's religious um, belief systems. Um, again, why, why things are happening so differently in Southeastern Iberia, I don't really know. <laughs> um, but I should say, and I have visited some of these sites, is there not, they're not very large. They're not huge. They're not like expansive cities. They're fairly small hilltop sites. Yes, with you know greater signs of sort of hierarchy and you know yes, some metals and gold and things like that. But you know, let, this is not like Uruk. Um, this is not like Teotihuacan here. <laughs> this is a totally different other scale of operation. So I, I think we have to be a little careful about calling these folks state level folks. Just my opinion. I may have pissed off some people right now, but anyway. <laughs> Anybody else have some questions? I see some things in the chat. So George says, intuitively, it seems like there should be a correlation between increased drought and increased construction of motillas but it doesn't seem to be demonstrated in your research. Um, well, it seems like there was a drought that was sort of beginning prior to the beginnings of these motillas. It's just that around 2200, these motillas began to be established. Um, this is a part of the world where I think a lot more dates could be, could, could, could shape, shape the way we understand things. Anybody else have any other questions? Now that I can freely move through my screen here. No other questions? Good, great attendance this time. Well, thank Is you for- Is there uh, any, any idea of population levels in each of these regions? You know, that's a really good question. Um, as you probably can guess, po population estimates, like actually coming up with numbers for sites or regions at a given period of time is, is really, really hard. Um, you know, each of these larger settlements, you know, Argaric sites, Copperate sites, could have, could have held, you know, a thousand, possibly, you know, a few more thousands, you know, we're talking one to three or so thousand folks. Again, not, not huge numbers of people. Um, but to say how many of these people were living at one given period of time, we don't really have good estimates for that. I'm afraid people haven't done that work um, to my understanding. It's notoriously difficult. Um, 
And again, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's hard because we can't really easily, because of the resolution of radiocarbon dates, it's really hard to know how many people were living at a given point in time, even at a site. You know, that means you'd have to basically get dates on all different kinds of houses and all the burials and, you know, that's a, that's a really, really hard thing to do and very expensive undertakings. Um, you know, I think the archeological picture is a little deceiving because what we see is a palimpsest. We just see like everything at one time, right? But how many of these places were being used and occupied and lived in at one given point was obviously a much smaller number of people. So um, yeah, that's, that's my sort of off the cuff answer to that question. What about connections between uh, these Iberian groups and what was uh, occurring in Mesopotamia at this time? Was there any trade? Was, was there any similarity in development or don't we know? Um, well, we have absolutely no evidence for anything, any objects coming from um, the Eastern Mediterranean world at this time in Iberia, pretty much, I can say that. Um, so that, I mean, those are the smoking guns, right? Those are the things that, that tell us that there are people interacting, you know, uh, you know, different parts of the world. We don't see, we don't see these things, but we do see, and I'm going to backpedal a little bit here. I mean, you do see that people in, let's say the late Neolithic sort of somewhat before the period that we're kind of looking at right here clearly were sharing a common idea of what their divinities may be or what their beings, their six spiritual sacred beings might have looked like. And I'm referring to some of the works I did, the work I did on the slate plaques, um, the engraved slate plaques, which I didn't talk about really at all in this talk. But there are clearly some similarities. Actually, there's a really striking um, object. I think, oh gosh, I can't remember which site in Syria it is, but there's, a, there's this object in, found in Syria that's more or less contemporary to the slate plaques. That is, you know, like, it's very, very similar to the stuff we see in Iberia. But, you know, what does that mean? I don't know, they were clearly not moving around uh, that much at that time, but they shared, I think throughout the Mediterranean world, maybe parts of Europe, you know, some general understanding of, you know, what a deity is supposed to look like if you're gonna make them on a piece of stone. Um, but in terms of the, again, the sort of smoking gun of trade goods, we don't have any evidence for that at this time. But well, wait Thank a minute, you, you, did, you did say that, uh that uh, amber from sicily sicily yeah was was coming in and so there must have been some sort of trade network and and yeah. and, and the very fact there was such a discrepancy between that one cache of 250 and the other one that was what like four or eight tells me that there there's something else at work there too besides uh simply trading yeah now it's true there are some, these objects of amber found in this one tomb. I mean, you, you have to kind of understand, like my response to that question is in part shaped by my, you know, understanding a little bit of the, the sort of back and forth that's gone in Iberia. In the old days in Iberian archeology, span let's say the 1970s, everything that happened in Iberia was, oh, it's because of the Eastern Mediterranean, right? It's like these civilized folks, they brought their, their ideas, their, their notions of metallurgy, monumental stone building, et cetera. So that was like one phase of research. And then there was a total rejection of this as people started to do radiocarbon dating and realize, hey, this stuff is happening in Iberia earlier than what we see in the Eastern Mediterranean. And we don't have these trade goods. So there's been, there was a pendulum shift to just looking at local forces and, and, and economic patterns and environmental um, variables, et cetera. Now the pendulum is swinging a little bit back into the sort of the external connections, right? But in a much more cautious way. So yes, absolutely. There are clearly signs that, that Iberia was integrated into social and economic networks in North Africa, in the central Mediterranean, other parts of Europe, uh, quite possibly. Um, but 
were those enough to explain what we're seeing on the ground in all places? I think we have to be a bit measured in that way. So, so again, when I started my career, if things were all Eastern Mediterranean, and then we went and rejected all that, it's all indigenous, and now we're kind of gently coming back to the connections, but we're not quite sure to how to, how to put it all together. So <laughs> stay tuned, in 10 years, we might have another story to tell. All right, any last chance? Well, thank you very much. That was a really great lecture. Thank you again. Thank you, Eric. Thanks for this opportunity. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Yeah, if you yeah, if you have any questions, reach out and we'll we'll forward forward them on. Okay. All right. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good evening.